All right, you guys can take it away. Thanks, Corey. It was great to hear those bird stories of recent sightings from around Wyndham County and perhaps a neighboring county. Um, I myself live in Hancock, New Hampshire, so two counties away, but for a number of years I was birding in Cheshire County and I'm fairly familiar with the Connecticut River. Um, so Chad, would you like to start us off? Sure, I'm just getting one of my resources ready. As you're doing that, I'd like to just quickly poll uh, the participants tonight. Um, you can either post in the chat or just raise your thumb. Um, on a scale of I've never used eBird before, thumbs down, to I could work for eBird, thumbs up, where would you fall in your comfort level with eBird? So about a lot of beginners here, that's great, welcome. We'll be covering a lot of the essentials today. A lot of you are about halfway, so somewhat comfortable with eBird, fantastic. Great, okay, so we've got a good mix of people here with us tonight. Um, I'm sure all of you will be able to learn something from what Chad and I have put together. Well, welcome everybody. Um, Stephen, if you wanna share your screen, um, Stephen will be kind of our, uh, lead here and getting us through the presentation. Um, but we're going to break it up and I'll show you in just a second what our agenda is. Okay, so um, tonight's presentation is going to be eBird Essentials. Uh, we hope to take your eBirding to the next level. Some of this may be um, familiar to you. It might be kind of rehashing some things you're, you are aware of, but we hope that there'll be something here for everybody. Okay, Stephen. So what is uh, tonight's agenda? Um, all the times are approximate, so uh, don't be too focused on that. We're gonna start with an eBird overview, um, just kind of showing you around the platform. Uh, one thing to note is that tonight's presentation is going to focus on the online uh, version of eBird and not necessarily the mobile version that you can have as an app on your smartphone. Um, there may be some things that are applicable, but that whole eBird app is kind of its own beast and, and best handled separately. So we think there's a lot to learn still about the online platform, especially for some beginners. And so we're gonna kind of do an overview of that. Uh, we will do an eBird live demo that Stephen will be leading, um, kind of showing you some examples of what we'll be overviewing. We'll then take a five minute bio break so people can use the restroom, get something to drink, stretch. And we'll come back with some Q and A where we can hopefully answer some of your questions that you're bringing and then follow up with uh, wrap up and best practices. So to really elevate your eBird uh, fully um, by the end of this. Okay, Steve. So a little bit about Stephen and myself, I'll tell you briefly about me and then Stephen can give a quick introduction for him. Um, so my name is Chad Whitko. I'm currently located in Vernon, Vermont, although I'm from the Hudson Valley of New York. Um, here's some of the kind of affiliations that I have. Um, I am a founder of the Antioch Bird Club, so Antioch University, New England. Uh, I've co-founded the uh, Bird Club in 2016 and currently sit as kind of an advisor uh, on one of our um, kind of informal boards. I'm also a, a scientist for the National Audubon Society, uh, specifically the Migratory Bird Initiative. Um, I also do some other science with them, but it's mostly through our migratory birds that uh, I work with for National Audubon. And I am also um, on the Science Advisory Council for BirdNote. And I'm just going to throw some links here in the chat if you guys are interested in checking out the Migratory Bird Initiative or BirdNote if you're not familiar with either of those. Uh, Stephen, about yourself. Find the unmute button. Hi, everybody. My name is Stephen Lamond. Uh, I, I work full time as an ecologist here in New Hampshire. Uh, as you can see from our top logos, that's where Chad and I met and when we were graduate students at Antioch University, New England. Uh, I knew ahead of time that there was an Antioch Bird Club before arriving on campus. And uh, it was such a great learning space for me to develop my birding and ornithological research skills. Uh, so I work full time with Moosewood Ecological. They're based just across the river in Chesterfield, New Hampshire. Uh, we do a lot of our work throughout the Granite State 
Um, and I also teach as a professor at Antioch University now, where I run the Antioch Spatial Analysis Lab doing a lot of GIS work. In my free time, I teach bird-related courses for Keene State College and the Harris Center for Conservation Education, and any leftover time is spent on eBird or iNaturalist getting to better understand our natural world. Chad, back to you. Thanks, Stephen. So a little bit about eBird. Um, eBird was first started in 2002 by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, often forgot about, the National Audubon Society was one of its founding partners. Uh, very generally, eBird is quite simply a way to store your bird observations, your bird photos, sound recordings, and bird video. And it's thus available to not only birders, but also educators and scientists like myself and some of my colleagues. And what I hope that by the end of this uh, presentation, what you'll find is that eBird is not only easy to use, easier perhaps than you might think, it's also perhaps more powerful than you might think, and it can actually be quite fun to uh, explore some of the features of eBird and to develop some of your um, bird knowledge. So uh, we hope by the end of it, you will find all those things to be true uh, and be more comfortable in um, some of the ways that you can store and access some of your own bird data. Next thing. So once you sign up for eBird, um, you know, we can certainly help anybody uh, afterwards if needed in doing that if you're not on eBird yet. But once you are an eBird member and you access the eBird homepage, uh, this is basically what you would see. And so um, if you go to the next slide, Stephen, what we're gonna focus on today are these three main um, elements to get people kind of grounded and introduced uh, into eBird and, and how to use it. Um, and these include submitting checklists or your observations, uh, exploring the, the data that's held and housed within eBird, and then what's called my eBird. So this is essentially all of your uh, data that is accessible. Um, and throughout some of this, you'll see how you can see what species that you've seen. Uh, you can look at your checklists. You can see what species you have media. Uh, such as photos or, or, or audio as well. So this is kind of um, the home base, I guess, for if you're using eBird for the first time, uh, what you would be seeing. Okay. So submitting a checklist. This is one of the uh, most like fundamental parts of, of eBird. This is where everything is built off of. You know, many of us have been birding a long time um, and have been birding on, you know, um, through many different eras of technology, but many of us have kept paper checklists, right? And so uh, it's very similar to a paper checklist. It's just kind of turned into uh, something more digital. Um, so when we go to submit a checklist, um, there's kind of three main areas that um, we kind of work through as we're doing that process. The first is documenting the location. So where it is that you are when you observe the bird or birds uh, that you had noted. The next is your effort. So how much effort did you put in? How far did you travel? How much time did you spend? Who else was with you? How many other observers did you have? Uh, this is the effort uh, part of a checklist and we'll discuss that as well for a little bit. And then of course the main part is observation. So what birds did you see or hear? Uh, this is really the main part of what eBird is about. And so we'll show you uh, how to become more comfortable with that. And one of the things that we'll also touch upon as well, because we often get questions about this, is how do I handle submitting sensitive species? You know, species that maybe, you know, we need to be careful about putting checklists out in the world where people can know where these birds are. And we can discuss that as well as why that is an issue. So we will cover submitting a checklist as one of the main elements of tonight. We're also going to look how we can use the explore function of eBird. This is one of my uh, favorite parts of eBird. And this is really where you can dive deep into um, the power of all the data that we all collect. Um, and then in doing the explore, Stephen, next slide, um, we will look at how you can explore various species of eBird. So eBird has all the world's bird species in it. And so you can explore each of their accounts. Uh, you can see maps, you can learn about the birds, see photos, see videos, so you can learn how to identify these species. We'll look about exploring regions, so perhaps something like Wyndham County, that might be a region that we be, would be interested in exploring and learning about what avifauna or birds are here. We'll look at maps and, and of course, exploring those. 
hotspots is very important. So many birders use eBird as a way to find out what hotspots are out there. A hotspot is basically just a community-based location um, that is usually accessible by all where many birders go and submit their observations. So something like Herrick's Cove might be a hotspot. We'll talk about uh, exploring media, which is really important for, um, for many of our checklist bar charts for these regions. So if you guys are perhaps thinking about going to somewhere else, you know, maybe Southeastern Arizona or um, Point Reyes National Seashore, you can look at bar charts to help orient yourself as to what species you might find. Uh, and then another feature that we'll look into is kind of these needs alerts or target alerts. So some of us on this call um, receive emails uh, and alerts for when birds are submitted to eBird. So if you are looking for a particular species you haven't seen yet for your life list, or if you're interested in seeing new birds in your region, such as Wyndham County, you can get alerts to let you know that that species has been seen. And so we'll touch upon that as well. And that's a really great way to kind of um, increase your birding knowledge uh, by knowing what's happening as it's happening live. Next slide. We'll also look at what my oh, eBird is. Yeah. Um, here's a profile for myself. Um, so we'll look at a little bit what that is. And then we'll also look into the my eBird kind of tab or section. Uh, next slide. And this is a really great way to learn about all the observations that you have seen, uh, all the locations you bird at, all the media you have. Uh, it's a really great way to summarize this. And there's a lot of functionality here that I think folks aren't really quite aware of. Um, so some of the things you can do in your, your eBird are to look at your checklists, the locations you bird. You can look at trip reports, which is kind of a cool feature, your alerts, your media, life lists, who your contacts are. So Stephen and I, you know, we're friends with each other through eBird. Um, and so you can see who you have in your contact list, which makes sharing checklists really easy. So somebody can be a designated checklist keeper and share their list with you when you're together. You can look at the profile page that we just showed uh, at the example, and then some sightings lists as well. A lot of functionality that we hope you guys will uh, appreciate seeing tonight. Okay, so, so even oh, sorry, Jen. <laughs> yeah. So with that, we'll uh, we'll dive into eBird. I'll just move a couple of Zoom things around here, and so here you can see your eBird homepage. Uh, list some statistics over here on the right, and what we're going to do first is submit a checklist. So earlier today, I was out for a walk. Uh, one of my favorite uh, places to go birding, just within walking distance uh, of where I live. And the first up is it's really important to figure out where you're recording birds because that narrows down the list of birds that's possible and helps scientists correlate our observations with the habitat at that particular location to help them uh, answer a lot of great research questions. And so I was birding nearby. You can type in uh, places that you've already been birding at. You can also search for it um, on a map as well. So I could type it, it was Pickering Farm Road in Hancock. Uh, and then I'll click continue. Next up is the date. Um, this also is a great filter for a list of potential species that you're likely to see. Um, and also is helpful for documenting the return of, of spring migrants, which they're doing right now as we speak. Um, it's just a little after sunset. So in the next hour or so, a couple million birds will take to the skies over the United States to work their way north. Uh, and so today's date is March 15th. I'll enter that here, make sure I have the correct um, month and year. If you wanted to enter in a historic checklist from a previous year all the way back in 1960, you'd be able to change your observation date with these features here. Up next comes the observation type. There's some handy more info buttons over here on the right, but I'll give you a quick synopsis of each of these. Um, I happen to be traveling, so I was walking down this road, but if I had been biking or slowly driving, those would also be considered a traveling checklist. Um, other types of checklists are the stationary checklist. You're not moving, um, usually more than 50 meters. You could be lounging in a chair, enjoying lunch on your back deck. Now, those would all fall under the stationary, stationary category. 
For historical checklists, um, these are good for older checklists that you've done in the past where you know you were birding, that's your primary purpose, but you don't know your start time, duration, distance, or other important parameters. So you can, you can lump those into historical checklists. And then incidental checklists are good when you're not actually birding. Perhaps you're gardening or driving down the highway and you see a snowy owl or a red-shouldered hawk fly over. You can still enter that into eBird. It's a very useful, it's a very useful data point. Um, but since you are not primarily birding and recording all of the birds around you to the best of your ability, those would go in as an incidental checklist. Um, these are the primary ones. Most eBirders don't go into other kinds of checklists, but there is a long list of different protocols uh, and checklist methods here. Uh, so the start time for this checklist was 3.04 p.m. You can enter it in with a 12-hour clock, that's by default, or you could choose the 24-hour clock uh, method. The duration for this Even? checklist, yeah, go ahead, Chad. You. You're listed on other still. I know you wanted to do a travel. Oh, thanks, Chad. Put that back to traveling checklist because I was walking. Uh, this is a fairly short checklist at just eight minutes. Uh, my distance, the road, I know because I've entered in checklists here many, many times, is just over a third of a mile, so 0 0.34 miles. Uh, party size of one, I was the only birder in my party. Checklist comments are optional, but I find this is a great way to record the weather so other birders know what the viewing conditions were during that checklist. And you can also use this as somewhat of a journal entry. 20 years from now, I can come back to this checklist and read what was the weather on that day when I saw these cool birds. And so I did make a couple notes. Uh, it was overcast, calm, uh, and about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Steve, um, did you want that to be a.m. or p.m.? Oh, thank you for catching that, Cherry. Uh, that should be p.m. <laughs> I was not awake at Walking 3 in the dark. a.m. <laughs> Thanks. Good catch. So the next step, once all of our effort data is collected, we can click continue. And the next step here is to enter in the species that were observed and how many. Um, so there's a couple ways to do this. You can scroll down through the list until you find what you're looking for. So for example, I saw uh, three wild turkeys and two morning doves. There's also a quick way where you can jump to a particular species by typing it in here. Downy woodpecker was the next one that I observed. Downy woodpecker, I saw one of those as well as one hairy woodpecker. I'll type in another black capped chickadee. eBird can read my thoughts and it will usually auto-complete uh, those, those things you type in. And if, you, if you're if you um, a birder and you know your alpha codes for various species, you can also just type that in at the top. So T-U-T-I is short for tufted titmouse. I could type it in there and it would bring me to the tufted titmouse entry. Uh, just a couple more species here. I had a couple of American robins four of those actually, and then one dark-eyed junco before it's gone for the summer. Uh, so these are all the birds that I actually saw, but I want to share with you a couple other example things that you can enter on your checklist. Um, so say, for example, I saw a duck flying overhead. It was very distant and backlit, and I couldn't tell if it was a mallard or an American black duck or something like that. So just by typing in duck, it not only lists duck species that are expected, but a couple larger taxonomic groupings, dabbling duck species. So I'll use that one just for the, an example for tonight. Um, there are other, other categories, duck species and waterfowl species there. And so these are options. As you're birding, identify things to the best of your ability, but don't go any farther than that. I'm not going to place a species name on that duck that was a mile and a half away. I'll just enter it in as a dabbling duck. That's as close as I can get. Um, in eBird, there are, are also, um, confusing species, and you can enter that simply in here. So say I saw a sharp-shinned hawk or a cooper's hawk, I couldn't narrow it down more than that. There's a category for those confusing, confusing species here on eBird. And so it's really, eBird is built um, to all birding levels, all, all bird watching capabilities. So I'll remove that one from my checklist because I didn't actually see it. 
Uh, I'll go back up to the dabbling duck and remove that one as well. Um, one more thing I'd like to also share with you is what happens if you see a rare species? So say for example, I saw a hermit thrush today. It's a little on the early side for hermit thrushes to be getting back to the Monadnock region. And eBird knows that based on all of the data that's been submitted. And so it doesn't come up as an option on this checklist. However, by clicking the add species button here, I can now add, it'll search the entire eBird database for hermit thrush. And I can click on the species and it will add it to the checklist. Note that it comes up with a label of rare. That's because it's too early for hermit thrushes to get back to the Monadnock region, typically. And so here I would want to enter in some comments, uh, medium sized thrush with distinctive uh, rufous tail, something along those lines. Hopefully I got a photo that I could add to this as well to back up my claim that I saw a hermit thrush. Once I've entered a little bit of documentation and Chad and I will talk more about this tonight, um, I'll just click this complete button and then I can move on with that checklist. But because I didn't actually, oh, go ahead, Chad. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, one other uh, thing that I wanted to point out is um, this is also a great place if you see and document a known subspecies of uh, a bird um, that normally wouldn't fall into this list. And so an example, Stephen, if you want to try to pull it up, was a few, uh, well, more than a few weeks ago now, I was lucky enough to have an organ type dark eyed junco uh, at my feeder in, um, in Burden which is a different subspecies than the uh, typical slate colored uh, that we would get. So this area of adding in uh, new species um, would be how you do that if you want to add some documentation in for a subspecies that would normally not be in the list. Great addition, Chad. So this checklist is complete. And what that means is that I'm submitting a checklist of all the birds I was able to identify. So I'll go ahead and click yes, and then submit this checklist. Once it's submitted, I get to the checklist page for this outing. The observer, traveling complete, it summarized the effort data and comments over on the left-hand side, and then what I actually saw here on the right. Once you get to this page, you can add media. So if you have photos or any audio recordings for birds that you encountered, you can upload those through this button. And if you need to go back and edit the species on your checklist, you can do it through this button here. So when Chad and I were at Antioch University, we created a group eBird account for all Antioch uh, people, students, staff, faculty, and alumni. And so we share our checklists with this Antioch University Bird Records account. This is the username for that account. Um, and then we just click share and it gets sent over to that account. And so if you're out birding with a party, uh, I recommend you, um, sharing one checklist amongst yourself rather than eight people submitting eight separate eBird checklists, even though you were all together. It helps with the data side on eBird. So once you have that checklist submitted, it's now time to explore some of these species. Um, you can view a species profile page by clicking on any of these links. All of the species you find on any eBird page um, are linked. Let's check out uh, a common species such as the black cap chickadee for starters. Uh, you'll see their profile page with some of the highest rated photos that have been taken of, of black cap chickadees and submitted to eBird. A little, uh, some facts about black cap chickadee identification. You can also li listen to top recordings for black cap chickadees. If you scroll farther down, there's some statistics for how many times you've recorded black cap chickadees. It looks like I recently passed my 5,000th eBird checklist with black cap chickadees. And you can also see a species range map uh, for, for the species, as well as more media, photos, audio, um, and even video. You can also get to this page by going to explore. So we started here on the submit tab for eBird. Over on explore, you can simply type in a species. Um, let's check out the Eastern Phoebe a species that should be arriving in all of our backyards fairly soon. And just by typing in 
on that page, you can get to that home page for the Eastern Phoebe. If we go back to the Explore homepage, uh, we'll move over to Species Maps here. We can view these in a larger window than on the Species Profile page. Um, Chad, is there a particular species that we should check out? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One I was thinking of uh, recently around here is American Woodcock is maybe uh, one that's coming back that a lot of people like. Great. So here's a map of American Woodcock sightings that have been submitted to eBird. Now note the date range where my cursor is in the top right hand side. These are all American Woodcock observations ever. And so we could filter these observations for just the current year to get a sense for where American Woodcock are on their migration north. So they're all over uh, Eastern United States. If we wanted to zoom in to Brattleboro, say, see if there's any American Woodcock in the area. Not quite yet, at least not documented on eBird. Here's one over in Westmoreland, New Hampshire. If we keep zooming out, we can start to see more and more woodcock uh, around. Once you zoom out to a certain level, it creates this purple grid where the legend is over here on the right. The darker the shade of purple, the higher the frequency or the more woodcock are being reported. By clicking show points sooner, we can get rid of that purple grid to see where birders are reporting woodcock. So to break down the legend a little bit more, all of the locations with a flame is a publicly accessible e-birding hotspot. Um, on the smaller marks here, these pin marks are personal locations. So they, these could be on private land or secret locations that people don't wanna share as readily with others. If they're shaded red, that means the bird has been seen in the last 30 days. If they're shaded blue, that means the woodcock has been seen more than a month ago. So closest to Wyndham County is this American woodcock observation here. We can click on that point to see who saw it, when they saw it, and how many were seen. If we wanted to view the actual checklist, we could click on the link here, and it would pull up the checklist that Gregory Seymour submitted on Friday night, a little past sunset. So there it is. So this, the species maps are a great way to explore uh, recent sightings, nearby sightings, and get a sense for the distribution of a species during any time of year. I would if also go, add. Oh, go ahead, Chad. Yeah, so if you go back to that map, Stephen, another feature that um, Stephen didn't click on, which is sometimes helpful, I find, for rare species is the explore rich media uh, section. So sometimes if you click on this, this will show you all of the pin locations on the map that contain some type of media for that species. So you can see that it's broken down into videos, photos, and audio. So you can see which of these uh, observations have those types of media attached to them. Um, and then I also find myself utilizing the filtering uh, function a lot up top regarding the uh, the time of year and, and what years are included. Um, so for a, a lot of the work that I do, I find that I can filter down to a set number of years or a set period of years and compare uh, what distributions are like for that species uh, through different periods of time. And so Stephen just clicked on this map. Uh, it's still filtered to the explore rich media uh, option, which is fine, but if you unclick that, here is all the um, observations during the breeding season, of which is June and July in eBird for the past 10 years. So this gives you a sense of where woodcocks are during the breeding season. Great, thanks, Chad. So lots of woodcock around. They're not exactly rare on the Northern New England landscape, uh, but they are habitat dependent. So if we zoomed in, on a lot of these points, we'd see that they're probably near wet meadows uh, or larger forest openings. Heading back to the Explore tab, we have a, a couple more things to explore. We've covered species maps and, and, uh, and the species pages themselves. If we wanted to hear more American woodcock in our lives, say they haven't shown up near our houses yet, uh, we could filter for any species in the world to look at photos and other media that have been submitted. So for the American woodcock, 
Uh, there's almost 10,000 photos of Woodcock on eBird that, that eBirders have shared, um, a little over 4,000 audio recordings and 118 videos. Um, so I'm going to pick a, a slightly different species. Let's change it to the Scarlet Tanager. We have a little bit longer to wait before these show up here in New England, but it's a, it's a beautiful bird. If we wanted to filter for photos of Scarlet Tanager within our area, we could go to uh, Wyndham, Vermont, filter by that location. And we could also filter by a date. So say we wanted to see what Scarlet Tanagers look like during the breeding season. Uh, so we're still looking at photos. These look like they're all male birds, but we could also apply additional filters. And there's a lot of filters we can use. So there was a paper published last year about the um, extent and the darkness of the face masks on peregrine falcons, and they used photos from eBird for that study. Uh, so that was really exciting. So photos are, are very helpful. If we wanted to filter for a particular sex, we can do that here as well, uh, as well as age, sound, behavior, breeding behavior, uh, photo tags, uh, and, uh, and other things. So we'll go ahead and, and hide these filters for now. So these are what scarlet tanagers, these look like they're all males, tend to look like in Wyndham County in June or July. But if we were to change the, the date filter to fall migration, we wouldn't see any red scarlet tanagers. All the males will have molted into their greenish uh, coloration They look similar to the females. So here's a great photo submitted by Colleen Lawler, September 1st at Herrick's Cove, important birding area. So it's a great way to find local photos um, of birds for, with, for, uh, for your area. Heading back to the Explorer homepage, uh, what we'll do now is travel to a region. Let's take a closer look at the county of Wyndham, Vermont from an eBird perspective. We get to the county homepage. This is what it looks like. So these region pages exist for counties, states, uh, and countries, and a couple other larger uh, geographic scales. Nearly 300 species have been reported to eBird in Wyndham County. When are you going to hit 300? Uh, I hope you get there in the next couple of years. Almost 2,000 eBirders have either live or have visited in Wyndham County, which is really, really great. Uh, and there's a, a scattering of 87 eBird hotspots throughout the area. Uh, so it looks like Ken Cox may have gotten the same snowy owl. Miller Farm viewed March 11th. There it is on the telephone pole. And so media for the region is stored over on the right. Um, you can explore the data in more detail over here on the left. And in the center, the main bulk of this page is a sightings list um, sorted by uh, date that was last seen. You can view how many, who saw them, what the location was, uh, and so on. So a lot of birds have been seen recently. I'm seeing a lot of waterfowl moving through the area. Peregrine falcons have returned. That's great to see. Uh, scrolling farther down, you can look at recent visits for eBirders in the area who have submitted checklists. You can look at the top ranked eBirders by species or checklists, uh, as well as the top birding hotspots. So what I'd like to do here is transition to look at a particular hotspot. Some of you may have visited the Brattleboro Marina or West River Trail uh, close to downtown Brattleboro. It's one of my favorite birding places to go when I'm over, when I'm over in Wyndham County. You can see a lot of other popular places listed. Putney Mountain is a great hawk watch site. Putney Great Meadow is fantastic for waterfowl during spring migration. So looking at this particular hotspot, this is just for the area around the Brattleboro Marina and the West River Trail. It's publicly accessible. Uh, a lot of eBirders have visited this location. We can see that the last checklist submitted was on March 11th, so not quite live time, but it's a popular location uh, and it does get a lot of visitation. Canada geese, mallards, black ducks are all back in the area. Uh, a couple killed deer have already migrated in. And then down below, we can see our top eBirders for that location. The sightings list defaults to last seen, so which birds were seen most recently. But if you wanted to take more of a historic approach 
from this eBird, uh, from this eBird hotspot page, you can look at the first seen list. So does anybody have a guess which species was most recently seen? Well, sorry, the page already is loaded. Philadelphia vireo, an uncommon migrating bird, uh, was the last addition to this particular location seen by Ben Whitington on September 9th, 2021. So just last fall migration. Morning warbler, blue-winged teal, marsh wren, and a couple other birds have been seen there uh, all last year, all great additions to this location. And we can also look at the location-specific high counts. So what's the maximum number of Canada geese seen at Brattleboro Marina? If you want to take a guess and post that in the chat, feel free to do so. Maximum number of Canada geese seen at this location. It'll take just a second to load here. All right, I haven't seen any guesses in the chat yet for how many geese have been seen at Brattleboro Marina. 3,500 from Chad. Well, it could be a fair guess. There's a good amount of open water there to host these Canada geese. I apologize, it looks like my internet has slowed down a little bit. Hopefully you all can still hear me. Either that or eBird is experiencing a lot of use at the moment. Oh, Cedar, great job, 800 European Starling. I think you're on the call tonight. That's the high count for Brattleboro Marina. 400 red ring blackbirds. Let's see if we can scroll down to find Canada geese. If we don't see it soon, I'll use a handy dandy search feature. Canada goose, 1,000 on October 8th, so during fall migration 2018. If we wanted to look at this checklist, all we have to do is click on that link there, and here it is. So 1,000 Canada geese flying in. Fortunately, there were some photos to accompany this observation. Here's a number of them flying in over the agricultural field there on the West River Trail. You can see 10 wood ducks, 110 mallards were also seen uh, that day. Oh, Lincoln Sparrow, nice, that's a good observation. And so we can see an eBird, it's all connected. We can access checklists from your profile page, we can access data and media from the media page, as well as the hotspots uh, and the regional pages as well. So eBird's done a great job of integrating this data on different pages and making sure there's multiple ways to access whatever it is that you're looking for. Uh, so if we zoom back out to Wyndham County, we could go back to the Explore page. All we need to do is just click on Wyndham County here. And what I'll show you next are the county's bar charts. This is a handy way if you're new to an area or if you've been living someplace for a long time, but you don't have a pulse yet on the local bird life and the movements of populations, you can look at what are called the bar charts. And this shows you the frequency of detection how likely you are to encounter a particular species in that region during each quarter month of the year. And so this is for all of Wyndham County combined. We can see a couple of rare species that have been seen here, like a fulvous whistling duck detected in early August, um, a couple brant here and there, more common in fall migration, taller green bars here, um, but one, maybe two has been seen during March in spring migration. We come down to the Canada geese. They're a year round resident according to eBird and we know that's true for those of you who have lived in Wyndham County long enough. Of course, they're more commonly detected in spring migration and again in fall migration, but they are present year round. Wood ducks by comparison, another waterfowl present most of the year, but during the coldest months of winter, they tend to disappear. If we keep scrolling down, we can see some species that are only present during migration, like ringneck ducks, spring and fall migration, um, lesser scop, another spring and fall migration only species. Keep scrolling down, and now we get to a wintering only species. So, common goldeneye arrives during late fall migration. They stick around in the Connecticut River during the winter, and then come spring migration by early May, 
all of the common golden eye have left. So these bar charts are a really fantastic way to understand the movements of local populations and help you plan for what time of year can you expect to see your first Eastern Phoebe or your first uh, killdeer, say. Chad? Yeah, um, thanks, Stephen. I just want to add that these bar charts, um, you can export this data if you would choose. Um, not everybody wants to look at spreadsheets or to go that in depth with it, but there is an option to um, uh, downloading this data. And uh, that was something that I, I had done last year at the start of the year. I had planned to do a, a big year effort for Wyndham County, trying to see as many species as I could. And the data comes out and what it does is it show you, shows you the percentage of checklists during each week of the year that a species has been um, put into eBird for Wyndham County. So I could use that information to help uh, plan where I might want to see birds at certain times based on what was being uh, observed during that week. So I could filter it out and see which week of the year I was in and which birds had the highest frequency and maybe the birds that were only seen uh, around that period of time with any good numbers. Um, so there's some great uh, ways that you can download this data and, and bring it into your birding if you wanna go way far advanced with it. Um, another feature that's really great about the bar charts, and Stephen, forgive me if you've touched on this, but is changing the date record. Um, so this is filtered down for the entire year but say you're going to another location and we'll just pretend that this is a place you've never been and you're going for a given, you know, a given month or a given period, uh, you can put that in. And what happens is that the bar chart will now only show you species that had been detected during that time of year for this area. So if you're wanting to learn about what you can see, you don't have to look through a checklist of 300 species. You could have the bar charts filter down to the time of year that you'll be there. So you have a much more reasonable list to, to work from uh, to learn what you might see. So I've just applied a, a date filter for Wyndham County from 2016 to 2022, birds that have been seen during March. And we can see that the number of species is down to 130, down from the county's total of 294, including a pink-footed goose, recent sighting there. Uh, one other thing you can do, so if you have a field guide handy and you turn to the page that has both Canada goose and cackling goose, uh, you know that they look very, very similar. Uh, and so one thing that we can do from our bar charts page is compare, well, how likely are both species? If we click on a particular species, that little line graph icon, we can see uh, a line chart now, a line graph for the frequency of Canada geese. And by clicking on change species, we can then add another species. Say we want to take a look at the cackling goose and add it in. We now see Canada geese is in pink, cackling goose is in blue. Any time of year, you're far more likely to see a Canada goose than a cackling goose here in Wyndham County. If you're traveling out west, this graph might be flip-flopped in some locations. Uh, this is a good way to compare your likelihood of seeing similar species uh, based on a particular area. Alrighty, heading back to the explore page, there's still more we can do with our eBird data. Um, up next will be our target species. So uh, and Chad last year was working on a Wyndham County big year, trying to find as many species as possible. I'm far behind Chad in that county, not being a Vermont resident. But if I wanted to say, find a new bird I've never seen in Wyndham County before, um, I wanted to add a new life bird to my Wyndham County list and say I'm able to visit this March, I can select Wyndham County as the region the time of year that I'm going over here on the top right. And I want uh, eBird to list all the species that are new for my Wyndham County life list. I could also view birds that would be new for my year list, my month list, and even my day list for that particular region. You could also search for birds that maybe aren't new for your county list, but your state list, your country list, or even some larger geographic scales. Show target species will bring you to that list, and it's sorted by the likelihood of uh, your, your, the frequency of detection for that species. 
So next time I go to Wyndham County, if it happens to be this month, I'm most likely to see a horned lark and a brown-headed cowbird as the new additions to my Wyndham County life list. So this is a really great way if you're, if you're traveling and you're looking for new birds you've never seen before, you can use the target species uh, by filtering in the location and date to figure out what you're most likely to detect. And then you know what to study in your field guide as you're sitting on the plane or riding in the back of a car to that destination. Once again, back to the Explore page. If you are able to hop in the car at a moment's notice and, and go look for a rare bird, I encourage you to sign up for the rare bird alerts here. You can click on this link. Uh, you can sign up for automatically generated emails from eBird that are sent out either daily or hourly uh, if you're looking for particularly rare birds. Stephen? Yes. Before you get into the rare bird alerts, which is a really great uh, feature, I just want to pass on a question from Ben that I think you might be able to answer uh, more efficiently than myself. So Ben asked, the app, the, the web app, or sorry, the mobile app, provides a list of target species that have been seen within X days and within X miles. Does the web browser have this capability? Additionally, is there a way to collate the recent observations into common locations? For instance, if I'm going to Houston, which hotspot has the most lifers for me? There is a way to answer the latter question. It would take a little bit of analysis in Excel uh, by downloading the hotspot specific data and comparing the frequencies of target species for each location. Uh, there's no way that for eBird to automate that without taking up too much computing space uh, and it would slow it down for everybody else. Uh, for your first question, if you wanted to see um, recent sightings of birds that you're looking for, um, the, the best way to do that would be to, to go to the species maps here, search for a particular species, and then see where it's been seen. And then you'd have to manually click on each location to see when that observation was. And so it's a little bit more cumbersome uh, to do it on eBird.org versus the app. So I'd stick to the app if you're looking for recent sightings for birds that you're looking for at specific locations. Um, Chad, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's um, well said. Great, good question. So here on the alerts page, you can see the alerts that I've signed up for. Uh, I have a, a couple needs things. So the target birds I, I need for these county lists, uh, the rare bird reports for New Hampshire, as well as rarities within the country, just in case another pink-footed goose happens to stop by or the tundra bean goose in New York State happens to come a little closer, I'd like to keep tabs on, on where those birds are. Uh, to sign up for them, all you need to do is enter a region that you're interested in. Uh, type that in here, for example, uh, Wyndham should Come on, apologize, my internet is, it seems to be a little bit slow, but you can type in the region you're interested in and then either click view or subscribe. So here, Wind of Vermont, I can view the, the list, the rare bird alert, um, or subscribe to it. Just a quick show of hands, or feel free to type in the chat, how many of you are currently signed up for some sort of rare bird alert? A couple folks, great. So within the last seven days, this is what the eBird rare bird alert focuses on, so you're not getting uh, any sightings in your email from more than a week ago. Chances are that bird might not still be around. So of course, the main attraction in Wyndham County right now is the pair of pink-footed geese that are being seen up in Westminster. Several folks have been able to spot a cackling geese in amongst the Canada geese, handful of black vultures and the snowy owls continuing, a couple early hermit thrush, and a fox sparrow and a swamp sparrow seen today by Joanne Russo. So some, some good uh, local rarities there. So that concludes the, the whirlwind tour of the Explore tab on eBird. What we'll do now is transition into my eBird. Of course, feel free to put your questions into the chat as we go along. Um, once I finish covering my eBird, uh, we'll, have, we'll take a short break, come back, and we'll have plenty of time to answer your questions and walk through a couple of demonstrations. So the My eBird feature on eBird.org is similar to the My eBird feature in the mobile app, but you can do a lot more with it once you're online. 
So this will just take a couple more seconds to load. Um, I'll go back to this preview slide we had here. Um, a couple things that we can see on, on our home eBird page. Uh, the total number of species observed by, by you, the eBirder, how many eBird checklists you've submitted, both complete checklists and total checklists. You can quickly access your own media, photos and audio, um, as well as compare how many birds you've seen so far this year versus where you were at last year and the previous year. So if you wanted to compete against yourself, these, these bars can, can help keep you on pace or let you know how far behind the pace you might be. All right, so let's head back over to eBird. Take another couple seconds. Um, Chad, if there's any relevant questions in the chat now, I could respond to one of those. I think we're all caught up for now. Um, there's a new one coming in. Um, do incidental checklists show up in summary reports? Um, yeah, I believe they do. Um, the incidental checklist will show up in the hotspot pages on eBird as well as the regional uh, accounts and the rare bird alerts. So incidentals do do show up in most places. But let me know if I've, I've misunderstood your question um, there. The, uh, the reason I asked, I asked the question is um, that <clears throat> I when I first started using eBird, I was confused between stationary and incidental because I know birds well enough that I see and hear them all the time when I'm not actually birding. So according to eBird's definition, that's an incidental sighting. Um, so I initially entered a lot of checklists as an incidental checklist, and I did not see them showing up in regional reports or my personal reports as part of total checklists. I didn't see the birds showing up that I had seen. Um, and I, I recall hearing that if it was marked incidental, it, it wasn't posted because it didn't have the other delineating information about location or, or duration of time and so forth. So that's why I was asking. Well, that's a good question. I know the data does get shared with eBird um, and I have had incidental checklists show up in, yeah. in various summaries. You can see that almost half of the eBird checklists I do submit are incidental checklists. Uh, just as I'm working, I'll note a blue jay calling out the window or the 10th black cap chickadee of the day, and I'll, I'll submit those to eBird. Um, and they show up. And I'm, I'm fairly sure they do show up. That's something okay. we could explore uh, during okay. the second half of the presentation, okay. if you like. That's good to know. Great, thanks. Even um, a quick question from Corey. Do researchers have the ability to filter out incidental and incomplete checklists when using data for analysis? Absolutely. And so complete checklists are always preferred, but not always, um, sometimes you're driving and you can't submit a complete checklist. You're going too fast and you need to focus on driving. And so researchers do have access to all your incidental checklists and it's stored as a column in the master eBird data set. So they could filter for complete checklists versus incomplete checklists um, to fine tune their scientific analysis. Great question. So on your eBird homepage, uh, you can view uh, how many birds you've seen in a particular area. So I default to my New Hampshire sphere where I, where I do most of my birding. If I wanted to change a region, I could go to over to Wyndham County, uh, Vermont. Here it is. And this will update all of the statistics that we see and, and the charts here to Wyndham County specifically. We can see latest checklists that have been submitted. It's still a little slow to load. So these are the things that I was birding today uh, here in New Hampshire. So looks like the media is taking a little long to load. Oh dear, <laughs> Wyndham doesn't exist. Let's try refreshing this page here. <laughs> Chad, if my internet slows down even more, I might uh, see if you could screen share to take over. Sure. Uh, while it's thinking, I'll just introduce a couple more things briefly. Uh, and then, okay, I'm running into some issues on my end. So Chad, why don't you take over from here if that's all right? Yeah. Oh, it's funny. 
Yeah. Okay, Maryland's Ebers. having a similar okay. issue. So it could be on Ebers and Ebers and uh, as a community science database, there's millions of users worldwide and it's growing rapidly every year. The downside with that is it might be getting a little slower. And so hopefully they're getting funding to get enough technological advances to keep the system up and running smooth. Yeah, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not able to load it, interestingly enough. Can I ask a question while you're waiting for it? Go ahead. Um, it's, so I have um, quite a bit of information within the family on both sides, going way back to the 30s and 40s, really detailed bird records <coughs> that I would like to eventually enter on eBird. And because I didn't look this up before, I asked you, I know I've run into problems doing that before because of some of the kinds of questions that they ask. Um, but it would be the historical record that you would use to enter those old records. Is that correct? That's correct. Unless you had complete effort data, time, okay. start time, date, duration, if it was traveling or stationary, et cetera. If you're missing any of those key criteria, uh, I submit it as a historical checklist. Okay. And otherwise, probably, oh, right. Stationary would be the next most likely, I would think, unless they had traveling. Yeah. Okay. Great question. And there's also um, protocol. Maybe we can find it during the break and link to it. If we can find a link for it in the chat. But um. There's ways when you're entering historical data, <clears throat> excuse me, that if you don't know some of the information such as date, um, I think it's like January 1st, 1900, um, I yeah. think is the, the date that you put in. Um, and it's a great way to be able to get that data in uh, somewhere. And many folks will do this too when it comes to their uh, life, what's called lifeless building. So if you don't have all the data for all the birds you've seen, but you want your eBird profile, to match your life list, um, you can you can create a, a life list building checklist, and there's protocol for that. And I think it includes submitting the date as January first, nineteen hundred. Oh, good. And so, you know, during a lot of my early cross country trips, you know, I had a lot of details of you know where birds were seen, such as maybe on the state level, things like that. And I didn't have all this, the the data that I had wanted. It was before eBird existed, really, or I was using it the way I am now. And so I use that functionality to try to get some of the, the birds in um, as best I could. That, that actually, I think that was my problem. Um, there was uh, arrival and leaving data for up here in Marlboro for my father-in-law and it would say 1945 August, but you know, it wouldn't have the day of the month. And then I was stumped, like, what do I do? Do I just put August? Do I put August 1st? But that might look early for this particular bird, you know, so I, I didn't know quite how to deal with it. And so with those types of records, you could submit it as um, 1945, January 1st, or mm, I put my foot in my mouth. You could do 1900, and then in the comments section for that record, put as much information as you know, and scientists would be able to filter that out and include it okay. in the observation and treat it how they see fit. Yeah, okay, good. All right, I'll throw this in the chat. Um, I think there's information here about um, lifeless building checklists and how to do that. Um, Stephen, is my screen showing? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'll try to pick up where Stephen left off. Um, so with the, the My eBird, you, as he said, you know, you can filter down to different regions. You know, I have this filtered here. Um, so you can see uh, how my efforts have compared. So this is like kind of like a bar chart going throughout the, the year itself. So think of January 1st on the far left and December 31st on the far right. So last year in Wyndham County, I saw 213 species and by March 15th, I had seen 84 species in Wyndham County last year, as compared to the 27 species this year. Um, and for me, like there's a huge difference between th these two years as my daughter was born in October. And so last March, I didn't have uh, the same responsibilities as I do now. So you can see how the birding efforts um, change differently for that. Um, as Stevie, Steven said, you can see your last checklist your latest media. Here's my uh, Oregon um, dark-eyed junco. 
Um, wow. So you can see some of those. Um, what else here? I can look at, you know, all of my, all right. Well, Stephen, it seems like eBird is under some maintenance. <laughs> just our luck. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so you can just, this is just a great way to dive deep into uh, your, your birding efforts. Um, it's also a great way that you can like dig into certain locations. And so you can see places like your own home uh, and see what your yard lists are, are like as well. Um, I'm afraid to click on anything because I don't know what, <laughs> what's going to happen here. Hmm. I use eBird about a hundred times a day. And it's just like the worst I've ever seen it. Um, so if you go to your contacts list, this is a great way uh, you can manage who you work with. Um, some folks are on this call, might even see their name here. Uh, so when you're out in the field and you wanna share a checklist with, with your friends, um, you, know, you get the, their username, you share it with them. And it, one of the great features is that down the road, if I'm birding with Steven and he shares a checklist, um, if, if we're not listed as friends, this, this, this checkbox here, I would get an email saying that a, a checklist had been shared with me and I would have to go into eBird and manually accept it. But if I click this, it automatically will dump it into my eBird uh, data. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't know the reason why they make you go through that manual process. Maybe they don't want people like dumping random checklists in other people's accounts um, perhaps, but um, this is a great way to just automate that. And so you can see who all your friends are and um, you can manage that there as well. Let's see here. So see if I can get the media to, to go. Um, so there's, this is just another way to get to your media. So your photos, so you can see um, some of my more recent photos here including pink-footed goose, stellar sea eagle in Maine, snowy owl um, up in Westminster, Iceland gull. Um, one of the things you can also do is you can filter this down uh, into your best photos. So you can see um, which of your photos have been uh, rated best um, by eBird users. I hope it goes. Hmm. Um, Chad, as that's loading, um, Corey posted a, a great question in the chat. Do you still have the option to remove any species from the shared checklist that you might not have seen? Yes. Yeah, there's, there's options for managing that. So sometimes when you share uh, checklists with, with folks, sometimes people see different things and there's ways to manage that after the fact to make sure that you're not adding something to your list um, that somebody else had seen if you really didn't see it. And that's not only important for uh, a data perspective, it's also important for perhaps maintaining or managing your own uh, life list. Um, so if, you know, Stephen and I saw the, we, we actually, Stephen and I actually were both at the Stellar Sea Eagle in Maine. Um, we were like one car behind each other driving to the location. We just randomly ran into each other. And, you know, if we had shared the same checklist and, Stephen did not see that bird because the bird flew a different direction than he was looking. Uh, he wouldn't want that bird added to his checklist, um, you know, if he really didn't see the bird. So there's options for removing that. Um, Stephen, I don't think this is going to load for me. So is there anything else you want to cover before we take a, a break with Q&A? We have about 20 minutes left. Uh, no, let's go into the break. Um, I'll try to preload some pages during the break so we don't have to wait for things to load. Uh, and then we can dive into our Q&A. Yeah, so we'll be back in about five minutes and we'll see you soon.
So we got a couple minutes still for everyone's back. Um, while we're waiting, I'm just curious if you guys want to throw in the chat maybe what um, species or, or species of birds you're most excited for this spring migration. So feel free to let us know what birds you're most excited to see in the next few weeks. American woodcock. It's a great one, Jamie. I have been wanting to go for a walk around dusk the last few nights. Um, just haven't gotten out. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a great bird. It's uh, I think it's one of the the best harbingers of spring, if you ask me. Warblers. Yeah, I mean, classic. They're the definition of spring in my mind. Red wings, so red wing blackbirds, yep, they're just starting to come back, um, driving through. I, I don't get out much these days, but you start seeing them this time of year and all the little openings and ponds, um, they're starting to take up territory. Others are moving through. Bobolinks, that's a, that's a great one. It's a great one, Corey. Um, Bobolinks are some of our uh, furthest migrants um, for a passerine or a songbird. And these birds go all the way from our grasslands down to uh, deep into South America. Um, pine and myrtle, yellow rump warblers, and winter wrens coming back to our land. Yes. Wilson snipe, is that the same as a woodcock? No, Chris, it is not, but they are closely related. Um, and if you go up to um, if you go up to Sand Hill Road, had a long day, Sand Hill, um, where the, the wetland is, um, sometimes in the spring you can hear uh, Wilson snipe winnowing above the, uh, the marsh. You can hear them displaying. Uh, and what's really interesting is about snipe and woodcock is both of them, when they're displaying, the sounds you hear are both are mechanical. So American woodcocks have specially shaped, special shaped um, primaries, so the outer feathers of their wings. And Wilson snipe, when they display the sounds you hear is from the outer tail feathers. So both great birds. Um, Chad, I've got some eBird pages preloaded uh, yeah. so we can round out the, the My eBird section uh, and then we can turn it over to question and answers. Sure. Do you want to share your screen, Stephen? You bet. So back on our My Profile page, I've filtered for Wyndham County, Vermont. Chad explained the charts here. So 2022, I'm doing fairly well compared to 2021. Not too bad for, for not living in Vermont. Um, from here, I can view my Vermont life list, or I'm sorry, I can view my eBird profile where I've reported birds in the United States. I could zoom into Vermont which I didn't preload, but you, you'd see when I did my graduate thesis work on golden wing warblers, I was doing a lot of e-birding in the Champlain Valley. Uh, and so I have fewer checklists over in the Northeast Kingdom uh, and down South. So this is where I did a lot of that thesis research up here. I can also take a closer look at my Vermont life list and sort when I first saw a species to when things were last seen. Uh, I could click on uh, say I wanted to view um, all of the, let's pick a more common species. Say all of the, uh, well, hooded warblers, semi-palmated sandpiper, there we go. It'll be until June or so until they show up. I've seen semi-palmated sandpipers four time in Vermont and it has the dates uh, and numbers and locations for those. So you can explore your past bird sightings really easily using eBird. You can also download this data as a CSV, uh, so you can load it into Microsoft Excel for further analysis, if you like. You could also filter by year or month, um, as well as location um, and species. So it's a great way to interact with your own bird sightings. And that location page, just real quick, that filter down on for, for locations is um, a great way to look at perhaps if you're keeping a yard list for yourself. Um, so you can put in your location there. 
if you do that. And speaking of locations, you can view all of the places you've ever submitted eBird checklists for. So here in Hancock, I've just passed 1500 eBird checklists um, and I can sort by various locations. But if you needed to edit a location, say it's gone from private property to public property and you wanted to make it an eBird hotspot, you can make all of those edits here through your locations page. You could filter for locations uh, that you've been birding within Vermont, say, instead of the world. And you could also filter for type of locations, if it's a public, a shared location, or a hotspot, or a personal location. So you can view uh, all of the hotspots I've been birding at in Vermont. Also from your My eBird page, you can access trip reports. This is a new feature as of late last year. I've only created four trip reports to memorialize uh, great birding adventures I've had in the past. And so here's one I took in October 2020 to keep track of fall migration down the mid-Atlantic coast. So there's a map of all the places I submitted eBird checklist for, and it summarizes uh, which states I was birding in, as well as all the birds that were seen on that trip. And so it's a great fun way to remember a trip uh, come, come yeah, years later. Uh, so that, that sort of rounds out our uh, eBird Essentials section for tonight. Uh, and so now we'll, thanks Chad for putting some links in the chat. Uh, we'll turn it over to some question and answers. So if you have a specific question about eBird or um, best practices, uh, Chad and I will either answer that or do a live demonstration to show you uh, how to do that. And I think, Chad, we missed a question from Lynn earlier. So I'd like to start with that. Um, if folks do have another question, uh, simply type the letter R into the chat, and then we'll go through your questions uh, in order that you posted that letter R. Uh, so Chad, from Lynn, can information be added into the app if you have no reception? Hi, Lynn, it's a good question. And uh, yeah, I believe that the app is able to store that data um, until you're able to get to a place that has the, the reception so you can edit in um, later on. So yeah, you, you don't have to worry about being in a remote place and not being able to take the, the data down that you would like. I have a limited data plan on my phone, so I don't use data when I'm out and about, but I still eBird. I keep track of all my observations and I save those checklists, but I don't submit them until I get home and I'm connected to the Wi-Fi. Okay, uh, Marilyn, you have an, an R. Would you like to um, unmute and ask your question? Marilyn, I think you're still muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, sorry about that. I have a couple of quick questions. Um, one um, is about um, rare birds. Um, I have I heard in the past that you're um, not, if you're going into search in the rare bird function under explore, that the, the timing is not always um, up to date to the minute. Um, I know that you get the rare bird reports and you can get them as you show daily or hourly, but um, can you just offer any comments about if you're exploring through rare birds, the, the timing of how quickly information is seen in that function. Great David, question. Sure. And so it is fairly live time, but it all depends on when people submit the checklist to eBird. So I'm birding out in the field, but I don't submit my checklist until I get home and I have access to Wi-Fi. So I may have seen the pink footed goose at 6.30 in the morning, but it might not show up in the rare bird alert because I didn't submit the checklist until 10.30 that morning. And so it's more of a function of when people are submitting the checklist when it shows up in that rare bird alert. Okay. There's okay, also, that's oh, Marilyn, there's also um, one factor I think um, to put into it as well. And that deals with um, in certain functionalities when you're going to look for the rare bird through, you know, maybe uh, the map function or whatever, um, some of them aren't shown yet because they have to be vetted first by an eBird reviewer. So an eBird reviewer, which I had done for a few years in, in New Hampshire, I was an eBird reviewer for the summer months. And so part of my job was to see the back end of eBird. So when folks submit um, their data, 
you know, sometimes there's rare birds. And my job as an eBird reviewer is to make sure that those rare bird settings are accurate. And so they sit in a queue and then you have to validate or invalidate those records based on the information that's provided. Um, it's kind of like being a, you know, a detective or a sleuth in a way. You have to look through the information and see if that bird was likely what was reported. And sometimes birds will sit in the queue um, because eBird reviewers are volunteers. And uh, until it's reviewed, um, it may not show up in certain functionality on eBird. I, I believe it's that way for the maps, like the maps won't show uh, until they're confirmed. Is that right, Stephen? Yeah, the okay, maps yes. and the regional summaries as well as the hotspots. Okay, that, that's great. That helps me understand better because I understand that a lot of these need to be confirmed. So I see them uh, um, hourly when they come through, but they're unconfirmed. And then, and then they may sit in the queue before I can find them in the search engine. Okay, great. My second question is um, um, a social one. I um, Oftentimes I'll be leaving a hotspot and see um, a friend coming into that hotspot. And I'm curious uh, after to know if I've told, uh, you know, if I've told them or if they're looking for a specific bird, I, I'm curious to, as if they saw it. So how can I look up if my friend saw the bird on, check on, on eBird? Well, it's a lot easier to do it in a hotspot. You can go look up that hotspot view, uh, via the yeah. explore page and yeah. see what their latest checklist was for that location. View the checklist and see if that particular bird is on the list. Of course, if it's a rare bird and it hasn't been vetted yet, it won't show up there. It'll only be visible in the rare bird alert. If it's at a private location, you'd have to go to the species maps to see if that person submitted a bird at that particular location. Okay. Another, another tip, Mary uh, Marilyn, that um, I also do is those profile pages where Stephen showed his map and I had an example early on. Um, those are yes. just like unique URLs, like web addresses. And so I bookmark some of my friends like Stephen and other people I know. And so I'll just sometimes click on their page and then just say, oh, like, you know, what were their latest checklists? Um, it's a little bit harder to dig through for, you know, for like just a given species, but um, it's a nice way to see what your friends are up to. Okay, that's a good that's a good uh, tip. Thank you. Great. Okay, I think uh, Sherry, you're up next. Oh, you're muted. I have a question about birding with groups. Um, I both lead walks that have groups of people keeping their, you know, everyone keeping their own checklists. And I also um, lead the Christmas bird count in town. And um, John Dunham was with us uh, this past winter and he set up a trip report. I, I think it was a trip report. Anyway, I'm not familiar with doing that easily. Um, so if, if taking the Christmas bird count as an example with three groups going out and keeping their own lists, is there a way to, there is, I think there is a way, isn't there to create some, an umbrella report or that pulls all that together and collates it or not? Yes and no. What <laughs> I'd recommend is that each group, so if you've broken the circle into three sectors, each yeah. sector creates their own trip report and then that report gets shared with the circle coordinator. Okay. Um, the other option would be to create a group eBird account where everybody's sharing their checklist with the group eBird account and then a trip report is created in the group eBird account. So it'd be like the, the group CBC for Marlboro, for instance. Yep, like that'd and be a great we use name. it at Christmas. Um, so for, in the case of the individual or for me, if I'm going out and stopping at several sites and I want to put all those together, would that be a trip report like your vacation report was? Is Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And so you'd set the filter for that day, essentially. All the checklists you submitted that day would be in that trip report. Okay. And, and, and it, does the protocol section tell you, sort of give you step by step on how to make sure you've done that right? It's fairly intuitive. Um, I'll, I'll share my screen here. And I know we're coming up on 830. Um, if we go to the trip reports page, you can create a trip report. And then you 
can give it a name, Marlboro Christmas bird count 2022, select the date of the Christmas bird count, a start time and an end time, and then visibility, you could keep it private or share it publicly if you wanted, but that's all there is to it. Once you have these okay. filters installed, you just click create trip report and it'll aggregate your data. Okay, and then if you've got, um, if, you're, if you have traveling initiated on your various, um, checklists, then that's going to compile the map for you, right? Yes, yes. So the tricky part with the eBird checklist is keeping track of whether they were foot hours or car hours, oh, yeah, right. because that's important <laughs> for Christmas bird count data. Right. It's yeah, not yeah. as easy to summarize that via eBird checklists. So definitely keep track of that on paper is my recommendation. Okay, okay good. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, I believe. Corey. Corey? Yeah, I just wondered if you could talk for a minute about what people should expect when they report a rare bird. I know that that can be a little bit overwhelming sometimes for people who are new to eBird. Um, and I've met people who get really mad and feel like, you know, somebody out there is not believing them or that it has to do with whether they're an, an accepted bird or not. And I guess just if people could know like what type of details they should provide and what type of communication they're going to have and also what the results will be if the eBird reviewer says like, yeah, we're not going to, we're not going to count that basically. So Stephen can talk about some of the um, details of what makes a, a good observation list. I think it's part of our best practices that we'll end with. I know we're at 830. So I'll say that, you know, if anybody wants to stay, I'm certainly happy to keep going through till we get through this. If people want to take off, obviously feel free to, it's wonderful having you. Um, I'll say from the eBird reviewer perspective, having been on that side, you know, I, I've had to work with a lot of folks where they will share something and you have to go to them and say, based on your details, can you provide more? It's, it, I, can't, I can't just say that you have or have not seen this species. Um, from an eBird reviewer perspective, it's never a personal thing. It's never, you know, this person is more uh, experienced birder than the next person. It's really based on the facts that's in, in front of you. Uh, and so I think all the eBird reviewers understand where you're coming from. Um, they all have a lot of humility and they're happy to work with you. And there's no judgment placed on you as, a, as an observer uh, or um, your abilities uh, to document. It's just strictly based on, on, if you were to read it and give it to a stranger, could they say, yeah, that's what they see and what they didn't see. Um, and so when, when you work with an eBird reviewer, what happens is that, you know, they will press you for some more details. Steve will talk about what makes good documentation for a rare bird. Um, and there's usually some back and forth uh, in, in that. Um, and hopefully a good eBird reviewer will, if, you know, there's evidence that suggests that maybe your bird wasn't what was, um, what you'd reported, will provide further documentation um, or further uh, resources for you to understand um, maybe why that bird wasn't accepted. Um, and it is tough. It is tough. There are some folks who sometimes will just come down to it and say, yeah, I know what I saw. And as an eBird reviewer, they have to say, well, we can't accept that. But the good news is, is that that while that data is not vetted and it doesn't go towards scientific um, outputs, it still stays in your eBird. It still stays in your life list. So it doesn't change what you, you feel comfortable in seeing. But scientists, when they pull the data, they're able to get the, the vetted data um, that they feel accurate um, is accurate and working with the analyses that they need. Um, so that's what I would say for that interaction. Um, and it can be tough. I've, I've been in other places, you know, uh, driving down to Florida and, and driving through Maryland had common ravens above a rest stop. And living in Vermont, how many common ravens do we see, right? So I've seen a ton of them. And the eBird reviewer for that area commented and said, can you provide information about these ravens that you saw? They're uncommon for our area. And so I had to do that. And I had to know that they're, you know, they're doing their job to make sure that the data is accurate. That's a really great question. Stephen, I don't know if you want to touch upon any of the other things now so we don't lose it. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen again. We've put together a slide of how to document rare species in eBird. Um, so let me pull this up here. So 
photos and audio are always preferred. These can often confirm your sighting with just one or two photos or a single audio recording. Uh, it's the best way to put the eBird reviewer in your own shoes and sort of relive that experience. They can see what you saw or hear what you heard. And so I can, I have a app on my phone I can use to record sound. I'm not a professional recordist, but it's something. Um, I have a, a decent camera with me. It's not high end or anything, but some photos are better than none. Oftentimes, however, I'm not traveling with my camera and I have stumbled across something that's rare. And so the written comments are critical. And here are some things that I recommend including. The diagnostic features of the bird. How did you identify it to the species that, that you think it is? And how did you eliminate, eliminate similar looking species? So this is a common ringed plover that was seen in Vermont a couple of years ago. Um, how can you tell that it's different from a semi-palmated plover? What are the details? What was your thought process as you looked at this bird? Put the reviewer in your shoes. Note the age and sex if possible. Uh, recognize the rarity of the sighting. If known, this isn't critical, uh, but it can be helpful for the eBird reviewer. What is your experience with the species? Now, what's your birding resume with uh, common ringed plovers? You know, say I was traveling in Europe for three years and I became extremely familiar with this species, or I've never seen this species before, but I've studied my field guide every night and I'm pretty sure this is what it is. So, What's your familiarity with the bird? Um, is it a known individual? So say that snowy owl down on Vernon Farm, it's good to note, you know, this bird has been reported by others, but don't only say a continuing bird. That doesn't prove to the eBird reviewer that you saw the snowy owl. Maybe it was a, uh, a lump of ice. And you're like, oh, there it is, it's in the field, I got it. Well, look closely and document it with lots of words uh, to make sure that it is what it is. Um, the habitat is also good. So very similar species might have different habitat preferences. Think about short-billed dowichers being more of a, a, fr a freshwater species, long-billed dowichers, I think being more of a brackish water species. Um, that can be critical for differentiating between similar species. Um, and then what are the viewing conditions? So when I went to go see the pink-footed goose, the weather was atrocious, but even 150 yards away through a good spotting scope at this magnification. And after watching the birds for half an hour, I could clearly see all of the details. So again, putting the eBird reviewer in your shoes as best as possible. What are your viewing conditions? What was the habitat, your experience with the bird? And of course the diagnostics for the bird. So, this common ring plover, I'm gonna show you a couple snippets of the checklist. There's a lot of words submitted here, but there was no doubt in the eBird reviewer's mind that this bird, what it was uh, because of the photos as well. So up at the top, they note the rarity. They had done their research. They thought this would be a first state record for Vermont. Indeed it was. And then they go into the description of the bird. The mid-sized plover seen with semi-palmated plover comparison to the common ringed, of which the common ring plover was obviously larger. Much darker and more expansive black mask with the black on the mask continuing to the gape. So all of these details that separate common ringed plover from the very similar looking semi-palmated plover. Further down in the next paragraph here, again, paragraphs of written documentation. Of course, this is a very rare bird. It's not a snowy owl, which is seasonally rare. They do show up from time to time, but this is a mega rarity. So the bird was seen in running, so a little bit of behavior, along a mud flat, there's the habitat, in front of us at 1.35 p.m. They don't talk too much about the lighting, so I inserted what that could look like here in good lighting through binoculars from about 40 feet away. Um, so these, are, these are good details to include. And then how long were you watching the bird? Was it flying and gone in half a second, or were you able to watch it and study it and spend time with this bird? And then down towards the bottom, They've run through and summarized all of those key identifying features uh, that they were able to witness for the species. And they direct the eBird reviewer to uh, a couple marks in their audio recording for when they can hear this common ringed plover calling. And then here's a link to, the, to that checklist here. And so for really rare birds, the more words, the better. 
photos and audio are always preferred. But this is a, a wonderful example of how to document a rare bird. Taking multiple perspectives and doing as much as you can should put the eBird reviewer in your shoes. Steven? Yeah. I just, want, I just want to share a funny anecdote about common ring plover. Um, so I get the ABA eBird um, rare bird alerts um, through my email. And it's, it's a daily ritual to scan through and see what birds have been seen across the continent or close to Vermont, if I ever wanted to think about chasing one. And uh, I'd seen a report for a common ring plover, uh, I believe it was in Massachusetts. And um, I just kind of quickly, quickly scanned down and was reading the description, right, to see, because sometimes you'll see rare birds and you look at the description in the notes and it's like, that's probably not what they saw because the notes aren't really, um, they're not substantive, substantiative enough. Um, but the, the description was all about the, the vocalization of the common ring plover, that the bird was heard only. And I was like, wow, like that's, that's a bold claim. Like, I don't know that I would know a common ring plover well enough by audio to make that claim. Who's this, who's this observer? And I looked and it was David Sibley. So um, it's like, okay, I think that, you know, that probably makes a lot of sense. Anyways. Thanks for sharing, Chad. It looks like Ben has the next question in the chat. Can you delete locations from your My Locations list? So prior to setting a location for my house, I use the GPS. So I have many locations that I filter through to the correct location. I've merged all the other haphazard checklists to the correct location, but the others still register on my account. You want to take that, Stephen? I have to. I would have to read that again to make sure I got all the information in. Yeah. So Ben, it, it sounds like, and feel free to unmute yourself and, and correct me if I'm interpreting this uh, wrongly. But it sounds like you've gone through and deleted all of the extra locations in your eBird.org account, but they're still showing up in the eBird app. Is that correct? So I haven't deleted the extra locations, and um, is that a possibility to be able to delete them? Well, you can delete them. Um, you can do that through my locations. You can also merge them. So say you've submitted a dozen checklists at different locations, but all within your yard. And now through eBird, you've created one location for my house. And it's perhaps your address or a nickname for your house. And what you can do is merge all of the surrounding checklists from your yard to that central location to aggregate the data. And that will update all of your past checklists so that they're updated to your house location, your, your new yard location. Um, so what I can do is hopefully if eBird's working, I'll just test it out before I share my screen, um, is I'll navigate over to the My Locations uh, page and I'll show you how to do that edit. So I have merged the old checklists um, before I created kind of a standardized version for my house. Yet when I go in to submit a checklist like at the area, um, it will offer me all of the other locations, um, like all of the various GPS locations that I've submitted at before, rather than just uh, the standardized version. And are you submitting through the eBird app or through eBird.org? Uh, the eBird app primarily. I've run into that as well. I, the app just seems to hold on to old locations that might not exist anymore, even though you've merged them through eBird.org. I'm not sure why that is. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and so there is a um, an eBird feedback page that you can access and send them an email and say, hey, you know, this is really annoying. Can you please fix this or, or find a way around it. And so uh, there is a way where you can let the eBird team know any difficulties you're experiencing or recommendations for improvements. Um, and they'll, they'll get back to you and say, you know, we've heard this before, or thanks for bringing this to our attention. Just don't expect it to be fixed overnight. They're pretty busy. Um, Thank you, Ben. Yeah, great question. Going through the list of questions, there's, first of all, there's a link put in by Nancy. Um, about an interesting way of combining checklists from different birders. Um, looks like a third party way of doing that. I've not seen this, so I'm interested in seeing what that's like. Um, for questions, next up is Cedar. Cedar, good to see you. Hi, good to see you, Cedar. I have a quick thing related to the rare bird reporting that I thought might be helpful for everybody to hear. It's something I've run up against is 
when you're out in the field and especially at a super rare bird, often I want to get the checklist submitted as quickly as possible because I want other people to be able to see that it's still there having it come through on the RBA. However, very rarely am I able to type anything extensive on my little tiny phone screen, especially if my hands are cold, it's very challenging just to type a couple words, much less any paragraphs. So I was wondering what you might like as Eber Rears, what is the best way to go about doing that? Because often I won't be able to either write an extensive paragraph or especially load photos or audio till maybe even a day later. Mm. And I will go back and do that when I can get back to my computer. But if I'm especially on a trip with only my phone, right? Yeah, what, what would be the best thing to do? Well, I, I will provide one tip. I think Stephen can handle some, some of the other details, but one tip I have for sometimes getting information down when I'm in the field is just using a talk to text function and then just copying that in um, to save yourself the, the trouble of cold finger tips. Um, I know for, for uh, you know, rare birds that if people are trying, like my experience of people trying to get the information out quickly, you know, obviously like time matters, right? So, I mean, birds have wings, they're able to move and you wanna get people on those birds as quickly as possible. If you're doing it through the eBird way versus like a local listserv or WhatsApp, um, I think the best thing to do is, you know, as tough as it is, is to provide some, some details and just a lot of folks will just say things like photos taken, added later, will add later, or um, at, you know, currently in the field, we'll add details later on. Um, but just do your best to, to be, I guess, short and, and succinct as best you can. Um, I don't know if there's any great protocol though. I mean, Stephen, do you have any thoughts to that as far as? There's no protocol as far as yeah. I'm aware. Um, <laughs> If you're local and you're tied into the bird community, there might be a WhatsApp group, a Facebook page, a listserv. You could quickly get the word out that way or text somebody and say, hey, are you at your computer? Get the word out. This is what's right. happening. Um, in terms of eBird, if you want to quickly submit a checklist and get the word out there, say, you know, I'm, I'm positive this is what it is, details forthcoming, I'm getting the word out to let people know. Something simple, submit the checklist, and then people are getting rare bird alerts will get it sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. And then when you get home, you can add as much detail as you like. So yeah, there's no best practice there. Uh, yeah, that's all I've got. Great yeah. question. <laughs> Yeah, one one tip that Steve, uh, Stephen mentioned, I think it's a great one, is calling somebody or, or reaching out to somebody who may not be in the field with you um, and getting the documentation to them so that they can maybe spread the word or take notes down for you. Um, and one story that I always remember uh, is when Stephen and I were both graduate students at Antioch. So we would we were very active birders at the Antioch University campus. It's like a nine acre campus. And we were always trying to see how many species we would see on that mostly urban campus and Stephen was birding there one day and I get a phone call from him first thing in the morning and he's like out of breath he's like I'm like oh my god like something there's an emergency what's going on Stephen and he tells me that he saw a frigate bird over campus and he starts documenting what he was seeing um, to help create this some type of validation almost like a second observer in a sense. Um, and so I was like taking down notes as he was like trying to scan the sky to, to find this you know, storm blown bird. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I think you only got it accepted at the frigate bird level, not like for any species, but yeah, sometimes reaching out to folks is a great way. Yeah, I couldn't rule out lesser frigate bird, <laughs> but it was probably a magnificent. Uh, so that's when it went down as a frigate bird species. Cedar, any other follow-ups to that, or are you okay? No, that, that's that's basically what I do. I just wanted to make sure, like, because I know other people probably have run into the same, you know, dilemma out in the field. And mostly, like, yeah, here, like, I'll send it to the WhatsApp, but it's, like, where this has come up is if I'm, like, at a chase bird somewhere other area that I don't know the local birders, and maybe there aren't tons of people there at the moment that I am. So I want yeah. to get the word out to people who might be on their way or something. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Cherry, you have a, an X in there. I'm assuming that's an R in disguise. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. It's just one big letter. Um, 
Uh, Chad, you were talking about um, submitting a, a rare bird with just the sound and um, the broad wing that, that flew that I'm, I'm, I'm sh you know, it's hard to say I'm absolutely positive because I couldn't see him. It was, the clouds were low. He was just out of sight and clear as a bell broad wing to me. But if we're submitting something like that and sound is all we're going with, which often is the case for me because I know sounds pretty well and I often don't see things I hear. Um, what constitutes good documentation if you're not David Sibley? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, um, for sound. That's a great question. Um, sound is tough, right? Um, I think the best thing you could do is, is be still so be as descriptive as you can. Um, you know, for an eBird reviewer, especially for a Broadwing, I mean, I would say arguably a Broadwing reported now is, is a month plus, you know, it's really a, about a month early. Um, it'll be a tough sell, to, to be honest, for, for any yeah. eBird reviewer. So what you would need to do is you would need to do your best to describe the sound, describe the quality, the tone, how long it was, uh, the duration that you heard it, you know, it, was it repeating, um, those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, and also like Stephen mentioned with the photographs, how you eliminated it from other species. So think about what might also sound like a broadwing hawk. And so, you know, you might have to say, I separated it out from a blue jay because this, or right. yeah. you can also use habitat to your advantage and say, you know, the, I heard the bird in this habitat or it was flying overhead. Um, all those things are, are helpful just in the same way as you would for a, a bird that's being visibly seen. Okay, yeah, that's good. We do um, actually, um, a lot of hawks fly over our property and um, up here and, and we also have a lot of open space. Um, so things come through early and I've had a hard time, you know, um, proving that on eBird, but we hear things ahead of what's posted anywhere else around here. Um, going through, so yeah. yeah. Thank you. And I'll uh, let's see if I either it's working a little bit more readily. So I'm going to just uh, share my screen. So can you see that? Mm -hmm. So using the explore function, I was able to I was able to filter down to Broadwing Hawk. Um, so for the spring season, March through May uh, of the current year. And so you can see where uh, yeah. broadwing hawks are. There's probably more broadwing hawks that are um, in portions of South America and just areas that aren't being birded. But um, what you're seeing here is, you know, this is kind of the northern limit of um, broadwing hawks currently through eBird. Um, that's not to say, I'm not trying to dissuade you and say that what you heard was not a broadwing, but just as a way for you to, or others to, to when you hear something, if you're like, hmm, could it have been this? Well, let me look into it a little bit. Um, yeah, and I know that there are some overwintering broadwings uh, that stay in Florida, but yeah, generally <laughs> this is about where they are. And so some of these sightings are, you know, just from a, probably a few days or a few weeks ago. Well, this is a, it's a good example as to why it would be great if more good birders, especially older ones, <laughs> were using eBird. Um, because these kinds of sightings, they're, they're like seconds long. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of birders out there who don't use eBird, who sure. are, yeah, who are quantifying what's going through all the time with good ears and eyes, but aren't putting it in the data system, so. And, and certainly um, for those of us who have um, older checklists, um, that are an eBird, it's a great exercise to go through and get them in, not only for yourself and to have that kind of archived, um, but also to add to the, the database going back, you know, so eBird was started in the early 2000s, um, but I mean, there's tons of bird data that, you know, predates that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there are some folks, like I know of somebody who, uh, a friend of mine in Pennsylvania, he was telling me about somebody that passed on in their region and somebody took up their checklists and they mm -hmm. have checklists going back to 1940, this person yeah, did. I do and too. <laughs> all kinds of really great birds, like yeah. super rare birds for that area, like loggerhead shrike, brambling, uh, pine grosbeak, things that are really interesting for that area. 
that are now in eBird as a result. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, one other, uh, see if I had it. Oh, so Stephen, a question for you that was kind of an impetus for some of this conversation to begin with is sensitive species. So, you know, there are some sensitive species that um, you can't really explore the data on. I know Chris had asked in the chat about great gray owls, you know, it just shows up as the purple grids. Um, that's because it's a sensitive species, right, where um, they're not showing you the exact locations. Um, but what about sensitive species that might get harassed by other birders or photographers, um, where it might be a problem for the bird? So thinking of snowy owls or long-eared owl roosts. Um, there's also some issues where, um, you know, some people uh, exclude certain sightings um, because they don't want birds to be targeted by, uh, you know, poachers or hunters. Um, this is very applicable in other parts of the world. Um, what are some ways to enter your data in? So it's in eBird as a record. It's data long-term. Um, you get it in your checklists, but it doesn't put the bird at risk. What are some tips that you have for that? Sure. Well, the best thing to do is be patient before posting to eBird. Hold on to that record. Don't share it publicly until after the season or maybe even the next year, depending on the sensitivity of that species, like a great gray owl. Uh, that, that's automatically blocked by eBird, say a snowy owl. Um, people love to see them, but they can be harassed by photographers. So waiting till the spring, once the snowy owl is left, and then putting that record into eBird. If you do want it to get it, if you do want to put the record into eBird a little bit quicker, what you can do is wait only eight days. And that way it doesn't show up in the rare bird alert. It gives the bird a little bit of time to maybe perhaps move on, maybe not. Um, and so it's not live updates on where this rare, sensitive, or easily disturbed species is. So you wait eight days and it won't show up in the rare bird alert. Yet another option, if you wanted to submit it the day of, is to generalize the location. So you could submit that bird to a hotspot, but don't give any details for where specifically at the hotspot it was seen. Uh, so say you saw a snowy owl at the West River Trail in Brattleboro, don't say where it was. It could have been near the bridge, but just put it in as the hotspot. So don't lead others to that bird that could be easily disturbed. Yet another option is to generalize the location even more and submit that record to the nearest town. So when you go to eBird, Chad, if you go to the submit page or the submit tab up at the top, you can search for specific locations, but you can also find an entire county, uh, state, or country. So you could submit it at the county level um, here if you wanted to. And then for a specific town, there's a way to do that uh, as well. So that helps. It's too vague for people to chase that bird, but it goes into eBird as a, as a solid record. So you can obscure it uh, spatially, and you can also just wait until either at least eight days or the end of the season before posting that bird to eBird. Well, these have been some really great questions. Um, I think Stephen and I would probably consider consider ourselves active eBird users, um, although I don't know if we would say we work for eBird if we're on that level. Um, eBird is, you know, really a great resource, and there's always a lot to learn. Um, if you would like, Stephen and I will put our contact information in the chat. So if there's any follow up questions, um, you can certainly feel free uh, to contact us after. Uh, and we hope that throughout this process, um, some information has been learned by everybody here, whether a beginner or an intermediate or expert. And with our last couple minutes, Chad, if you wanna go ahead and put our emails in the chat, um, I'd like to share my screen. Do you mind stopping your share? I'll just share a couple best practices for when you're out e-birding in terms of when do you start a new checklist? Uh, and then I'll, I'll end with a really nice uh, map to inspire us to do more e-birding. Let's go back to our presentation.
So eBird is all about collecting data from normal people like us and sharing it with scientists so they can, they can better and more effectively conserve birds and their populations. And the crux of that, making our observations more useful for scientists, it boils down to the checklist and how can we make our checklist more meaningful? So right up at the top, complete checklists are always better than incomplete checklists. Incomplete checklists are still useful. Complete ones are better because they have detection versus non-detection, whereas incomplete checklists are presence only. Our second bullet point here, count estimates are always better than X's. So as you're submitting an eBird checklist, you can submit a capital letter X to notate that the species was present. But we all saw the birds. We know, is it closer to one, 10, 100, 1,000, 100,000? A guesstimate is always better than an X. It gives folks an idea of how many birds were there. Of course, accurate counts are better than estimates, but sometimes we don't have time to count all 4,576 Canada geese at Putney Great Meadows. We can just estimate to 5,000. When to start a new checklist? If any of these change, I highly recommend starting a new checklist. Uh, this helps scientists better correlate species presence and abundance with different habitat and environmental variables. So if you're changing a location, consider starting a new checklist. If you're changing a major habitat, say from the boreal zone uh, on Mount, um, uh, Mount Mansfield up into the alpine zone, start a new checklist perhaps. Um, if your birding mode changes, if you're standing still for 15 minutes and then you start walking, you could split that into a stationary checklist followed by a traveling checklist. This is a tricky one, the next one. If the number of birders in your party changes, I recommend starting a new checklist and making sure that you have one checklist for the group and you're sharing it. It's trickier if you're all chasing a rare bird and you don't know who's around you. There could be 80 people and they're all showing up at different times. That's okay. Scientists have ways to control all of those stellar sea eagles that are being reported from the coast of Maine. Um, but shared checklists are generally better. Um, and because the effort is changing when more people show up, more eyes are seeing more birds, it's good to quantify that with a new checklist. If your mode of transportation is changing, so say you get out of your car and you start bike riding, they're both traveling checklists, but you're traveling at different speeds. Um, and that should be quantified in, via different checklists. Um, in terms of distance and duration, the eBird recommendation is checklists should not be longer than five miles. They still can be, you can submit them to eBird, but they're generally thrown out when it comes to spatial analysis. And so keep your checklist less than five miles long. One mile is even better. It's a lot, especially if you're walking all day to do a checklist every single mile, but the data quality is much, much higher. Similarly with duration, eBird officially recommends keeping checklists shorter than three hours. Think about it this way, American woodcock are only up in the sky during certain hours of dusk and dawn. That entire period is often within three hours. And so if you wanted to find, if you wanted to answer a question about when specifically American woodcock are flying relative to civil twilight, we would want shorter checklists to answer that question. And so eBird recommends three hours, but one hour maximum is better for those checklists. So if you're doing a big sit and you're staying in one location for 12 hours, do 12 separate checklists to see how the birds change each hour throughout the course of the day. So a couple of recommendations there. Yeah, Chad. Just real quick. One thing I don't know if we touched upon, but distance, marking down the correct distance um, for a traveling checklist. You're walking out, say, on the West River Trail, you're walking out and then coming back to your car. Um, what is the distance that you put for that? It's the one-way distance. I'm glad you asked, Chad. And so for out and back checklists, eBird, the eBird app, records the total distance that you walked. But if it's an out and back path, you'll want to divide that distance by two. So essentially the distance criteria, the distance parameter that's getting entered for your eBird checklist is the unique area that was covered while eBirding. And so if you're walking in a loop, you could do the total distance as recorded by the eBird app. If you're driving in a straight line, you could do the total distance. It's just those out and back trips, or if you're doing a, a lollipop, you'd want to subtract the stem of the lollipop or divide that by half so that it's the unique 
distance traveled on your eBird checklist? Great question, Chad. And as Chad already mentioned, eBird reviewers are your friend. They're the quality assurance and quality control for eBird. They're making sure we're not submitting random sightings of loggerhead strikes here in Vermont. Um, they wanna make sure that all of our sightings are as accurate as possible so that they're vetted for scientists. Um, and we'll end on, on a really beautiful part of eBird. Um, and this is the abundance animations. This is one for a, the black pole warbler, a neotropical migrant. Uh, eBird has crunched all of the data we've submitted, the billions and billions of records, and come up with these uh, abundance maps that move. I'm so used to flipping through Sibley's and they just have the static range maps. It's breeding here, it's migrating through here, and it's wintering down in, in South America. Um, but eBird has crunched all of our observations and they've produced these living maps to show how black pole warblers are migrating uh, and where you can see them and at what frequency during each week of the year. These maps would not be possible without eBird users. So give yourselves a pat on the back. If you're new to eBird, welcome. Your data is contributing to these efforts. Alrighty, well, it's, we're way past 8.30 at this point. It's now nine. This has been a fantastic conversation. I'm so glad uh, that everybody joined and I hope we can do this again in the future. Yeah, thank you everyone. And Corey, thank, thank you. you for hosting. Yeah, thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Chad. This was terrific. Thanks a lot.